This is the first in a series of lectures on the imaging of the salivary glands. Let's start with the salivary glands. There are four types of salivary glands, three major and one minor type of salivary gland. The parotid glands are located in the preauricular tissues and they are drained by Stenson's duct. The submandibular gland is located in the submandibular triangle, as you would expect, and they are drained by Wharton's duct. The sublingual glands live in the floor of the mouth. Their drainage pathway varies. Sometimes they join in with Wharton's duct, and sometimes they drain independently into the floor of the mouth. Minor salivary glands are dotted throughout all of the mucosal surfaces. Any mucosal surface will have minor salivary glands in it, and thus the spectrum of pathology that we're discussing can arise essentially on any mucosal surface. With the parotid glands. The parotid glands are divided into deep and superficial lobes. The anatomic dividing line between the deep and superficial lobes is the facial nerve as it splays in a sagittal plane through the parotid gland. Unfortunately, we can't see the nerve itself on imaging studies, and so we need to use a surrogate marker. We use the retromandibular vein. The, if you draw a line between the retromandibular vein and the stylomastoid foramen, that's approximately the location of the facial nerve. And that's the dividing line between our superficial lobe and our deep lobe. Another important anatomic feature is the stylomandibular tunnel. If you go from the styloid process to the edge of the mandi mandible, that gap is the stylomandibular tunnel, and you'll note that the deep lobe of the parotid knuckles through that stylomandibular tunnel. It's an important reference point, and it's useful to show that the gland is not enlarged in that location. The density of the parotid gland varies during our lifetime. In children, the parotid gland will be just as dense as the underlying masseter muscle. In older adults, there is so much fatty atrophy in the gland that it becomes almost identical in attenuation to the overlying fat. But in most people, it's somewhere in between, and it can be distinguished both from the muscle and from the fat. Although we speak of superficial and deep lobes of the parotid gland, there actually is an inconstant third lobe, and that's the accessory lobe. When it exists, the accessory lobe lives atop, that is superficial to, the masseter muscle. It can be very asymmetric and can be mistaken for a pathologic mass, both clinically and on imaging. The key to avoiding that error is to note that the texture of the accessory lobe is identical to the texture of the rest of the parotid gland. The parotid gland is unique among salivary glands in that it has encapsulated lymph nodes. This makes the parotid gland prone to a variety of additional diseases because of the presence of those nodes. The submandibular glands lie lateral to the anterior bellies of the digastric muscles, and a small amount of the submandibular gland loops up around the back of the mylohyoid muscle. The mylohyoid muscle has a free posterior edge. There's nothing anchoring the back of the mylohyoid muscle. So although most of the submandibular gland lives down in the neck in the submandibular triangle, a little lip comes up and around the back of the mylohyoid and is actually in the floor of mouth. Another important aspect of the submandibular triangle is the anterior facial vein. The anterior facial vein runs between the submandibular gland and the lymph nodes of the submandibular triangle. Thus, if you have a mass in this vicinity and you aren't sure whether it arose from a lymph node or from the gland, you can look for displacement of the anterior facial vein to see whether it has been displaced forward by a mass in the gland or whether it still lies between the mass and the gland, in which case the mass arose from the node. 
The sublingual gland lies in the floor of mouth. It is an elongated structure along the lingual surface of the mandibular body in the floor of mouth. It is distinguishable by its characteristic enhancement pattern. Notice how close the, sublingu the sublingual gland lies to the mandible itself. It's almost right up on top of the bone. In addition to the sublingual gland, you will sometimes see ectopic foci of tissue anywhere along the line between the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland. These ectopic areas of tissue are considered normal and should not be mistaken for pathologic masses. So how do we image the salivary glands? Well, we can use several different modalities. CT is advantageous in that it is good to identify calculi, which are a common cause of inflammatory pathology in the salivary glands. MRI is often touted as better to establish the extent of soft tissue masses, but this remains an unproven point in the literature. The most interesting modality is the one that is unique to the salivary glands, and that is sciolography. Sciolography can be performed in a conventional manner uh, using fluoroscopy during injection of contrast, or it can be done in a cross-sectional manner in which the contrast is administered and then cross-sectional images either with MRI or CT are performed. Sciolography has been presumed to have a therapeutic effect in that it can rinse out thick secretions from the gland and the duct, although this has not been proven effective. Silography has undergone a decline over the past decade as a result of the advent of silendoscopy. Silendoscopy is performed in the office of the otolaryngologist and is more convenient for the otolaryngologist, so uh, it is often performed at the expense of silography. But in recent years, a new diagnosis has arisen uh, in rheumatology circles, and these mixed connective tissue disorders often have as one of their components inflammation of the salivary glands. So sciolography is a good test for this and uh, thus it has been resurrected and is once again being performed conventional sciolography. To perform a sciolagram you begin with scout films of the face to ensure that there are no visible calculi. Then you cannulate the duct of interest, either Stenson's duct or Wharton's duct, and you inject contrast material, iodinated contrast material, in a retrograde fashion back into the gland. Originally this examination was performed with oil-based contrast agents, but water-based contrast agents are much more available and produce decent images. After images have been taken, a washout is performed in which the patient is given a sialagog, usually lemon juice, which should uh, cause the gland to contract and all of the iodinated contrast to be expelled and swallowed. When this examination is performed as a CT sialogram, very dilute iodinated contrast is used. When it is performed as an MR sialogram, either very dilute gadolinium-based contrast can be used, or just water can be used, and high-resolution T2-weighted images can be used to image the duct. This is an example of an abnormal parotid sialogram. Unlike the smooth, tapering duct that we saw on the normal image on the previous slide, on this slide, the duct has areas of dilatation interspersed with foci of stenosis. This is called a string of pearls sign, and it is indicative of chronic sialadenitis from any source, usually either stone disease, chronic bacterial infections, or autoimmune diseases, which we'll talk about in a moment. Notice that some of the daughter ducts are larger than the parent duct. This is also an abnormal finding. The ducts should continue to taper and become very small as they progress to the periphery of the gland.
There is one duct in particular that is worth pointing out. This is the duct to the accessory lobe, or the accessory duct, and you'll notice that it is distinct from the remainder of the intraglandular ductal system. This point right here between the intraglandular and extraglandular ductal system is, is at the hilum of the gland, and it is an important reference point for us.